Hello and welcome to this episode of Crossing Borders with Nathan Lustig, where I have conversations with entrepreneurs doing business across borders and the people who support them, with a focus on those with some connection to Latin America. My guest today is Pedro Pablo del Campo, a Chilean entrepreneur and investor who is a new addition to our team at Magma Partners. Born in Punta Arenas, one of the most southerly cities in the world, Pedro and I talk about his career working in nonprofit startups and supporting entrepreneurs in Chile, New York, and Austin. We cover his experience co-founding a design agency and becoming CEO of one of their client's companies, a healthy food vending machine company, leading to its acquisition in the Chilean market, to his working at Techstar supporting entrepreneurs around the world and the ecosystem in Latin America. We also talk about the lessons he learned working at Techstars, how he thinks the Latin American, Latin American market and ecosystem is continuing to mature, and how we hope to work with founders and startups in the Latin American ecosystem at Magma over the next few years. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Pedro Pablo del Campo. Hello, Pedro. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for taking the time to do it today. No, thank you, Nathan. Of course. So where are you in the world today? Today, I'm in Austin, Texas, capital of Texas. And how do you like Austin? Man, I love Austin. It has been a great experience the last few years living here with, with family. Um, great weather, although right now it's super hot here. Nothing, almost 40 degrees every single day, but we already got used to it. So um, great people around here. I really feel the, the southern hospitality of the U.S. here in Austin. So very happy of being here. So what are you working on in Austin? Um, Austin, right now, I'm, I'm, I recently joined Magma Partners, so super proud of it. And um, basically right now, as Magma grows... Um, so my main role right now is running operations with Magma, but also stay in close contact with uh, our portfolio, talk with potential investments, and evaluate new opportunities for, for our fund. Yeah, and we're really happy to have you. It's been great working with you so far and definitely excited to be able to continue to help build the, the ecosystem and support great entrepreneurs in, in LATAM. So where are you from originally? So I'm from Chile originally. I was born in Punta Arenas, so probably one of the southern cities of the world. Uh, I just lived a couple of months over there. Then I moved back to, to Santiago. Uh, but yeah, I was born in Chile, originally from Chile, grown and raised in, in, in Chile. And do you end up going back to Punta Arenas as you were growing up? Or I, did you just yeah. end up living in Santiago? Yeah, no, no, no. You know why? Uh, well, my father was um, was part of the Air Force, so I ended up going back to Punta Arenas for a couple of months until he retired from the Air Force and he joined uh, La Deco from <laughs> like an old airline. Uh, so yeah, basically I lived there while I was super young for a couple of months. So basically I have brief memories of Punta Arenas. I really want to come back eventually, but no, I haven't been there for, I don't know, 30 years at least. And as you were growing up, as the son of a pilot, did you get to travel a lot? Yes, that's one of the beautiful things about being uh, the son of a pilot. So basically, I've been lucky enough of being in every single continent. So basically, I've been in Africa, Europe, Asia, um, New Zealand, and most of the countries in, in, in Latin America. So yeah, I've been traveling a lot, especially lately. Do you think that traveling at a younger age gave you a perspective that was different from most Chileans that you were growing up with? Um, I don't know. I, I don't like to say that I have a different perspective from the regular Chilean, but definitely um, it provided me with uh, another perspective. Like, a, no, I don't know if a different perspective, but um, I don't know. The um, I've always wanted to come back to the U.S. or moving to other countries just because of the experience, I think. For us as a family and for me personally, I, I think it would be just for to stay in the same country. So getting to know more people, um, professionally speaking also, has been a great experience to live abroad. So, so yeah, definitely I would recommend people to travel abroad, but yeah. And 
you've taken somewhat of a, an untraditional path, or at least now you're, you're on a not more non-traditional path working with a venture capital fund, uh, rather than, you know, you could go and probably get a really good job, high paying job at a bank or at an insurance company or something that's sort of a more traditional path, especially in, in Latin America. Do you think, how, how do you think that, uh, being from Chile and the upbringing that you had, uh, plays into that if anything um so basically just to make my 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 long story short the last decade i've been involved in the entrepreneurial experience so from that first experience i i understood that my path my personal path will be related to the entrepreneurial world so that's why that you correct that i've had multiple offers join like big corporations but I'm convinced that for me, the best way to live a happy life would be related to something related to, to the entrepreneurial world. I think that although right now in the short term, I could get more income coming from big corporations, in the long term, I think um, I would be able to capitalize um, in a better way all my experience that I've, been, have, I've had the uh, recent years. And where did you end up going to university? So Universidad Adolfo Ibáñez in Chile. And what was that like? It was a good experience, but after my first entrepreneurial experience, I understood that I didn't know anything about like running a business and everything. So um, looking backwards, I think it's I think it's a nonsense. You should go to college, and um, but again, I. Immediately, once I started working for an early stage company, I understood that I didn't know anything. And what was your first experience with uh, an early stage company? Yeah, so, um, yeah, that's almost more than a decade ago. But back in 2007, 2008, I think, I was the first CEO of the first not-for-profit company in Chile called Latte, which is uh, Heartbeat in English. Um, so although I was the CEO, I used to do everything as the only and lonely employee. Like I do sales, logistics, production, everything. So basically, our first product was purified water. Uh, and now they not only sell water, but milk and toilet paper. So super proud of that first experience. Uh, that's where I understood that building my own or working for an early stage company was going to be my professional focus. Uh, I learned a lot, but if I think of 10 years ago, again, I didn't know that much. I would do so many things in a different way, and uh, but I really like it and, and I really appreciate it. I really appreciate the opportunity to work with the founder and bring um, um, with the founder, Pedro Traverso, uh, which um, he earned the Social Entrepreneurship Award a couple of years ago because of this company. So basically this company was selling it's still selling purified um, water, and all the profits uh, are um, donated to well-recognized uh, foundations in, in Chile. And how did you decide to join a foundation rather than going into, say, the corporate world? Yeah, actually, this is not the foundation. It was the, a not-for-profit company. So basically, it was basically a company running like a, like a real business. Um, but my first experience uh, working for like a corporation and corporate world was, I think I didn't really feel like fell, fall in love with it. And I always wanted to do something for my own. So um, after that first experience, I decided to like explore the entrepreneurial world with, with Latte. So in order to not to screw up, with my own money, so uh, having the opportunity of working with uh, with these people, like amazing entrepreneurs, um, very good people, uh, was a nonsense for me. And you said you learned a lot. And what were some of the biggest things that you had as takeaways from your time working at Latte? Um, I guess that I, I was super young by that time, and I thought I I knew everything. So I learned, again, that I knew nothing. 
So basically, I started surrounding myself with uh, people who I can learn from. So basically, find your own mentors, uh, build a strong network for yourself in order to get help. That was my biggest lessons out of that work. And that you, you need to, you will keep learning like for the rest of your life. So you don't have to think that you know everything because you don't, you don't know shit, right? And what did you do next? So after that, um, we decided with my family to go to New York. Basically, my wife was um, uh, decided to study a master's degree. So she got accepted at Columbia University. And uh, we ended up in New York. Great experience over there. Two years. Um, I worked uh, for a Chilean retail store where we sold Chilean gourmet products, craft products, and of course, wine. I learned a lot about wine. And um, what I did over there uh, was basically start operations. And finally, I was the wholesale manager for that company and built a wholesale plan uh, for them before I moved back to Chile. It was like, like, it's a tough space in New York. Just think about of being there in 2008, 2009, uh, in the middle of the crisis, not a lot of jobs. So basically, I ended up with this company, good opportunity of keep exploring the entrepreneurial world um, in another city, completely different. Like, it was a completely different jungle over there. But great experience over there. Learned a lot about what things to do in the right way, what what things to avoid. And um, but but after that, we came back to to Chile. Was that the Chile store that was in sort of near like uh, Soho that was selling like Chilean wine yeah, and Chilean exactly products? Exactly that 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 was the one. It was literally in the middle point of um, um, Little Italy, Soho, and Chinatown. Yeah, I remember. I I went there. I think in like 2011 or 2012, uh, just because I was walking by. At, on a trip during New York, I didn't didn't even know that it was there and saw. It. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I gotta go in here. Yeah, it was a huge store over there. I don't know what happened with them, like in 2012, but it was a like huge space in the middle of New York. Uh, yeah, so it was a good experience. What were some of the biggest contrasts between doing business in New York versus doing business in Chile? Um, I think in New York. It's um, it's completely different. I think in New York it was really tough because um, I think nobody, especially in that time, I think nobody wants to help you over there in New York unless you get you already got like strong networks. So um, doing business in New York, you have to know the right people, um, and again, you don't get much support from the community. It's truly truly difficult for us for me personally it was it was truly difficult and in santiago if you lucky i mean if you're lucky enough to be be part of a strong network you can get to the right people really easily like getting introductions to the right people i mean it's it's really easy but um yeah it's it's a completely different scenario in new york and in chile and even with austin it's a completely different way of doing things how would you compare Austin to Chile in, in New York? Yeah, Austin has been was was a great surprise. Actually, when we moved to to Austin in two thousand and fourteen, early two thousand and fifteen, um, we didn't know what to really expect from this experience. So basically we didn't before we moved to Austin, we didn't come to Austin before. So we already knew we already knew that it was a tech hub spot in the U.S., which was one of my requirements to come back to the U.S. And um, uh, but we didn't know ma that much. But it was uh, a pleasant surprise that we we encounter a very welcome community here in in Austin, uh, completely open and 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 willing to open their networks if you bring and, and, and provide value to the network. Um, so 
it has been much easier for us to get settled in, in, in Austin. I think, again, the Southern hospitality of Austin, it's truly amazing. So, but although it has been growing insanely the last couple of years, um, Austin still feels like a small town. So you talked about making the jump from New York and going back to, to Chile and then going back to the U.S., why did you go back to Chile after New York and what did you end up doing there? Yeah, the, the original plan was to stay in New York for my wife to, um, to start her PhD degree. But, um, well, I had some issues with my family. My dad was really sick, so uh, we decided to come back to Chile. And then there was, I, I decided to, that I really wanted to do my own stuff. Like I, so, so basically, I wanted to found my, my, my own company and um, so I ended up partnering with three amazing co-founders at uh, Visualogica 2011, and which is basically a design agency based in Santiago. That company is still running. Um, I had to give all the credit to, to my partners that are still running the business. Um, this is where I learned how important it is to have the right people, complementary people to your skills in this entrepreneurial journey. So basically right now we work with big corporate partners. They have a solid business uh, with more than 20 employees. Uh, so uh, yeah, that company runs by itself with those amazing partners. And, and while I was in, at Visologica, um, we, we had a customer uh, called Son of Snack. And um, basically what happened is that I took over um, the CEO role, the CEO role at this company. Um, so because we understood that there was a huge gap in, in, this, in, in this, this industry, the healthy, the healthy, the, the, the vending industry. So we understood that customer service and logistics was key in this. And um, so we were successful at running a super efficient company with low burning rate and probably the best customer service among uh, my competitors there. So basically we bootstrapped that business and after three years we got acquired by one of the major players in the industry. Uh, super boring, super boring uh, business, but um, it was a great experience just because of the acquisition, the process of going through that, um, through that, that path was super interesting, uh, but um, yeah. I mean, I love boring businesses. That's one of the things that we look for at, at Magma is like, is this a boring business? Because a lot of times if you can get into a boring business, it's not going to be one of those ones where you end up with a ton of competition. So if you just do it well, it ends up being uh, pretty interesting. So I think that's 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 pretty fun that uh, you were able to do that. One thing that's interesting there is you were working at an agency and basically either spun out yourself or took some agency resources to help build a company. I think that ends up being a dream of most people that have any sort of agency is how can I either productize the product that I have or um, work on something else that could be instead of selling my time, I'm selling uh, a product or, or a business. How did you make that work? And what advice would you give to people that want to do that? Yeah, so basically when I partnered with Visualogica, we, on purpose, we decided that my role besides bringing business or being like business development manager, helping with operations, was going to find uh, another business in order to invest in or to work on. So basically we, dis we decided that on purpose. That's one of the first thing that we, we did. And then um, we just saw the opportunity over there. So basically what happened was that the former CEO of Sano Snack um, was having some like family issues. He had to go back to his family business. We analyzed the business, like not long enough. I mean, not very long. We didn't, took, uh, we didn't take too much time in order to evaluate the business. We met with uh, our co-founders, um, I would say five times. We knew, we, knew, we knew the founders of that company as well before. So um, my only um, condition was to be the CEO of that company. So um, 
So basically, we saw the opportunity, again, in a super boring business, um, huge amount of customer uh, unhappiness because of the service. And um, we decided to give it a try, and we built a, a successful company, a uh, very healthy company, not only in their service, but also in, in but like the company by itself was a very healthy company. So we were very mindful of like paying us a fair salary, paying us, paying the the workers a very good salary to keep them on board of our company, um, to keep them happy, to keep like keep our customers very happy about our service. So I think it was a very well thought business, but if you, Nathan, one time you will ask me, hey, would you go back to the vending industry? And I believe me, I, I, I had many, many opportunities to go back to the industry. I wouldn't go back there just because of like, I didn't like the industry, but it was a great, great, great experience. And so after doing that business, how did you end up back in Austin? Um, so, so before that, also during during New York, while I was in New York, I met this another great friend, still a friend, Javier Vergara, who had this crazy idea of um, create a foundation for cities in order to improve their quality of life. I think it's important to mention this this part of, of my story as well. Um, so basically, when we came back from New York, uh, so I founded Visualogica, I joined Sun Snack, and in the meantime, um, I helped Javier uh, found, um, which is called Ciudad Emergente Foundation. Uh, so basically, what they're doing is they are still building inexpensive tools to improve life in different cities across the region, sponsored by big companies. Um, so basically I was the co-founder and board member of, of that foundation, met amazing founders, and Javier has been able to like build a very nice foundation with great success. So, so long story short about coming back to the US, um, while uh, in the process of the acquisition of, of Santa Snack, um, we thought with my wife that we had some unfinished business in, 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 in the U.S. in terms of her, especially in terms of her Ph.D. degree. So uh, one day I told her, you know what, um, if you want to go back to, to the U.S., let's do it now. Maybe this is the right time. Uh, I think she was already pregnant with my first son. So I told her, you know what, maybe it will take me uh, a little time to get a job over there. I want to do something for Latin America. So uh, my goal was to spend the first six months just to with my son. He was six months old when we moved to Austin. And um, yeah, the main reason was for her to uh, follow uh, her path on the PhD degree here in the University of Texas at Austin. So um, while I was taking care of my son, um, which was an amazing experience. Um, I met, uh, I started building my network. It was easier here than in New York, as I told you before. I met uh, Jason Seeds, which is um, currently the Techstars Chief Investing Officer. Um, basically, this is another advice that I would give to, 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 to founders or entrepreneurs. Uh, I, I wrote him, I emailed him like out of nowhere just like a cold email. I wasn't afraid of doing that. And uh, basically I didn't have any expectations out of that email, but uh, I think it was only one email, but you have to be um, persistent with cold emailing. But we met, I asked him to grab a coffee with me because I had good plans for how to connect the US and the Latin American ecosystem. Uh, I love what Techstars was doing over there. Of course, if you think about the accelerator, acceleration programs, you think either YC or Techstars. YC didn't, I mean, doesn't exist in, in Austin. They only exist in, in, in San Francisco. So I met this like amazing, brilliant, smart guy. And once I had lunch with him again, um, I told to myself, you know what, I want to work with this kind of people, like with this type of people. I want to learn from these people. Then I was lucky enough, I met the CEO at the happy hour of uh, Texas at Austin. 
Um, he was literally on shorts. Uh, remember, shirt. We got a beer. We talked about the Latin American ecosystem. We talked about their plans in order to grow their business. And I just fell in love with, with Techstars and what were they doing. And um, although there was not a position open for LATAM, I pushed them really hard. I provided some value. I connected them with Startup Chile to get them deal flow. And finally, I think <laughs> they got tired of me and they created a role for me as their regional director of business development for Latin America. So after that experience, they promoted me and I became the sales director for startup programs where I was in charge of providing corporate partners with opportunities to engage with literally hundreds of thousands of entrepreneurs in their industry through Startup Week and Startup Weekend. So uh, that experience with Texas was, was truly amazing. I learned a lot. Um, and again, I realized that what I learned from my previous experience was nothing compared to what I learned from Techstars. In order to work with the entrepreneurs, what should I be looking to uh, in entrepreneurs? What um, type of teams that I would be, I would love to work with? And um, yeah, in terms of like experiences, Texas was was truly amazing. So you talked about creating your own role. Uh, and I think one of the most important things you said is that you delivered value and helped them at, at the beginning, even before there was a role for you. And we get a lot of inbound requests for people wanting to get into venture capital or get into the startup world. And you did it with just starting networking and providing value. Can you talk a little bit more about how you did it and what advice you'd give to other people who maybe want to follow that path? Sure. Uh, first of all, again, first advice, don't be afraid of cold emailing people. And don't be afraid, no matter if they're uh, the CEO, uh, VP level. I mean, there's, there's a lot of people willing to talk to people, right? Especially, I mean, in the U.S., I think... People here in the U.S. are used to network, so they are used to receiving a lot of cold emails. So if you can just show them that you can provide some value, like my value was to try to connect them, although I didn't have like a, a real plan to do it. Uh, I told them, you know what, I can help you get into, I don't know, Latin America. So basically that was, uh, that was why it caught um, Jason's eye, I think, here. It was very honest conversation. It was a fun conversation. We're still friends up until now, after even I left Techstars. So um, I think uh, you have to, when you really want to work for someone or if you really want to explore opportunities in certain industries, you have to provide value no matter how you, th I mean, no matter if you think that you are not good enough for that industry or you're not good enough for the company, you just have to keep trying. And um I was lucky enough that I had the time and the financial um, the financial situation in order to wait for for a little time. But you can also do this while you're uh, working for someone else and you want to change industry or if you want to move to another company. So just to provide some value to someone, uh, it will open. Uh, mm, great doors in many, many places. So that's why I ended up with Texas. Basically, not bothering people, but truly providing value. I ended up uh, organizing, although I was not directly involved, but I ended up um, sending Nati Sola, who was, he was, he, I was reading some emails before this, this podcast, but he ended up in Startup Chile, like four years ago, trying to find um, good entrepreneurs coming out of that program he ended up traveling within Chile as well. Um, another program manager went to start up Chile. Uh, Jenny Fielding, he went, that, that's one of our probably most important managing directors for, for Techstars, ended up in Chile again. So basically connecting not only Techstars, open doors in Techstars, but also open me doors with uh, Startup Chile because I provided value for them as well. So I still have great relationships with people from Startup Chile, great friends. Seba Vidal, right now it's a Parallel 18. We became really, really good friends with them. Rocio Fonseca, which is um, 
right now working for Corfo, also good friend, Sofia working for Accenture. So basically, I think one of my key goals without probably knowing was build a strong network here in Austin. So don't be afraid basically to build a, a strong network and don't be afraid to ask for help. Just try to provide some value, just a little value, and you will get amazing results out of it. Yeah, I think the providing value is is the key point. I mean, I think reviewing a lot of the inbound requests that I get, the vast, vast majority are just saying, I want to have a conversation to pick your brain. And that doesn't really, that, that's not super interesting. You know, I'll, I'll do some of them every once in a while to try to help out. But the the best way to either get our attention or um, or at least get a response is to, if you have questions, super direct questions are very easy to answer because most of the time, the question you're asking is not the first time that someone's asked it. So we maybe have a podcast or we have an article uh, that we've already done that we can send you or happy to try to put out a response. But if it's just a very vague thing with no ask or no value add, it's really hard for us to provide value as well. Yep, completely uh, agree. I would say the other thing too, for people interested, um, mentioned Seba Vidal and Rocio Fonseca. Both of them have been on the podcast. I'll put their their episodes in the show notes at the end if you're interested. Sure, yeah. Yeah, I know they've been here. So it's an honor to be here for me. No, it's great to have you as well. So tell me a little bit more about the Techstars experience. What are some of the biggest lessons you learned working with them? Yeah, so um, first of all, this is where I learn a lot more about startups, innovation, and how the corporate world really needs to start working with startups. So basically, I also I met amazing founders, C-level executives from the co- top corporations around the globe, passionate managing directors who invested and helped our, our portfolio. And um, another great experience that would love to apply here at Magma, eventually, Nathan, would be is that once you're tech stars, you're tech stars for life. So you're basically like ah, Pedro del Campo. It's a small node into this huge network where you can get access to almost anywhere and everywhere, right? So they do this on purpose and they truly want to build the strongest and largest and technological ecosystem in the globe. So basically right now I can get access to almost anyone uh, at an, an entrepreneurial ecosystem at a global level. So um, another great experience that I learned is that, and and completely regarding the the latest news here in in the Latin American ecosystem is, for example, the latest linear acquisition with Falabella. I think it's it's a good sign uh, that these big enterprises need to accelerate their own processes in order to compete with other players coming to, to the Latin America. Latin American market. So in this case, uh, it's Amazon. But I expect that in the next few years, we'll have big disruptors in in other industries coming from Latam. So I don't know, let's say Nubank from Brazil. It's a great example. The bank industry will have to adapt themselves um, in order to not be disrupted. Or they need to understand that they want to be disrupted, that they they need to start working more and more and more with startups. So... uh, um, I respect a lot, for example, the hackathons and meetups that many companies are organizing now. It's a hot topic right now in Latin America, but that will not definitely help them pro- to protect themselves from, from big disruptors. Um, final example on these topics and, and completely connected to Techstars. Uh, at Techstars, tech every single year, they bring hundreds of investors and companies that want to talk with startups, disrupting their industries to learn the latest trends um, in their industry or explore acquisitions or biz dev opportunities, right? So last year, California, um, there was only one company from Latin America who came to the um, to this event. I invi- we invited a lot of them, but it looks like they still don't feel threatened by this and they will only take actions if they threaten by by a startup or a big company coming to 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 take some big chunk of their market, so 
the Amazons and even the smallest startups of the world are coming for you guys. So even if you if they take a few points of your market, that means huge amount of millions of dollars in revenue. And that's that's one of the things I learned from tech stars, um, company, big companies, because I used to work with a lot of like C level um, executives from these big companies that are willing that want to start working with entrepreneurs. Um, they truly are learning, learning that if they don't accelerate their own processes, they will get disrupted and they will lose. So uh, I think it's it's uh, again regarding linear, although the numbers may be good, may be bad, maybe they are, are not that good, or maybe I don't know. Uh, it, I think it's a good sign that this is happening. So I'm very excited of what's going to happen in Latin America in the next few years. I mean, even a year and a half to two years ago, and not to mention, you know, seven or eight when I was first coming to Chile and starting to talk with executives and, and family offices with uh, with my old business before Magma, most of the people that I talked to like literally laugh uh, when I would talk about that, hey, there's tech coming, they're going to disrupt your business because it just hadn't happened before, especially in Chile, which is fairly, now it's more open, but it was fairly closed off uh, just even geographically in uh, 2010. I have a stat that someone told me when I first was in Startup Chile that in 2009, only about 5% of Chileans had ever met a foreigner that wasn't Argentine, Bolivian, or Peruvian. Wow. And now that's massively changed because of all the immigration from Colombia and Venezuela, Argentina, Haiti, and also the price of airfare has dropped massively in, in Chile to allow people to travel to Brazil and Colombia and the US and Europe a, a lot in Australia a lot easier but w do you think there's any other motivator that will help big companies and family offices in Latin America realize that they should be looking at entrepreneurship other than fear or is it really just a fear thing at Techstars to be honest, I will be completely honest um, so at Techstars we used to play a lot with the fear and um, we used to play a lot with uh, business cases of uh, our current partners to like, hey, if you, if you don't take action right now, you will get to start it. Now, like it will happen eventually, um, maybe in one year, maybe in five years, but it will happen. What, what are you going to do about it? Right? Are you going to build your own stuff with your r and I don't know, budget? It will take you five to 10 years in order to build like a new solution and to start navigating with all the different departments within your company, it's a nonsense. It will be a nightmare for anyone to try to build a, like a completely new product or to create a spin out, a spin out, a spin off of, of, of your company. Why don't you partner with one of the most important accelerators in the world? And uh, and we're specializing in, in 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 connecting the corporate world with startups, and you will be able to accelerate those processes to I don't know three months or even six months, and we will coach you and we will teach you guys in order to how to learn, not only how to work with these guys but also how to improve your processes within your own company. So basically, honestly, what I've what I learned from Latin America, what they move. They they are being moved by fear, right? So basically, right now, if you read the news, it's all about fear. And if you and if you read about the like the feedback and the comments under the news, it's all about fear. So, um, but I think it, it shouldn't be like that. I think there's amazing talent in Latin America, people building amazing companies in Latin America, uh, people willing to work with big corporations and willing to. Uh, teach their, I don't know, their knowledge to these corporations. It shouldn't be like that uh, because there's a huge amount of value that entrepreneurs are creating within the Latin American entrepreneurial ecosystem. So although I still think that what really moves them, it's fear, it shouldn't be like this. They need to be more proactive. So that's, I would love to keep working with corporations in Latin America. Uh, and um, connecting the entrepreneurial world with uh, with the corporate world. There's a lot of things to do right now, and I think what will happen in the next months 
few months um, in terms of different acquisitions that are happening right now will help driving that um, that that movement uh, in the positive positive way. So I would love to see more, for example, corporate development um, people talking with with VCs like us or going to big events uh, like tech stocks, right? I'm, so having those opportunities of taking a look of what's going on in their industries, it's just invaluable. And they just don't understand it. They just still don't understand it or they don't give the right value to, to this opportunities. Yeah, I mean, I think that the Falabella acquisition of Lineo for I think it was 138 million is potentially an inflection point for startups in the region because Latin America is f- even more follower centric than than the US. So if you see a Falabella or potentially a Walmart or other large companies starting to make acquisitions in the region, the rest of them are going to start saying, well, if they're doing it, I can do it too. And sort of have the cover for spending that amount, that amount of money or investing that amount of money in a startup. And I, I hope that it starts to get, pe- get people in the bigger companies to think about the build versus buy uh, equation a lot more deeply. I mean, we, we've seen many times where it would make much more sense for the company to just buy it and bring the talent in and bring in a solution that's already working than having to try to struggle to build it. We've even had times where companies have tried to build it for two years and then come back to the startup that tried to sell them the product uh, to, to buy their solution two years later after having wasted you know, millions of dollars. Yeah. I, but go ahead. I was I was going to say the the last piece too that I hope gets is starting to change although we'll see is that many family owned businesses are still have an attitude of why should I make these startup founders rich what have they done to to deserve it which I think is an unfortunate attitude and hopefully it starts to change Yeah definitely I think it's uh something that is changing right now actually We've been lucky enough to have LPs coming from family offices. Um, but um, regarding the um, one, one thing that you mentioned about big companies working with entrepreneurs, I think there's, there's a couple of great examples, of course, coming from Latin America. But uh, actually, next Monday, I have this call with a guy named uh, Fernando Moncayo, truly amazing entrepreneur. Uh, coming from Ecuador, he went through Techstars uh, retail program in partnership with Target. Target is like, this guy is coming from Ecuador, Quito, right? A small country within Latin America. And he has built an amazing, amazing business. Target, I think they put like four to six million dollars into, into their business. And it's becoming like a keystone for Target in order to not be like, Literally, Target is fighting for their life right now, and they need to find this type of entrepreneurs who will help them save their like their business, right? So, no matter where you are, if you're coming from either Chile, Ecuador, Venezuela, no matter where you're coming, there's a lot of opportunities for entrepreneurs from Latin America to build successful um, businesses, not only for the region but also for U.S. big companies. What are some of the your favorite books, blogs, podcasts, documentaries that you like to recommend either to entrepreneurs in helping build their business or just to people to that you think uh, could use advice from, from one of these? Yeah, my go-to books right now are basically the last one I, I, I read and I, I, I think I've recommended multiple times the last couple of weeks. It's Never Split the Difference by Christopher Boss which is uh, all about communication and negotiation. It's a super easy book to read. Uh, it's a little bit, maybe it's a sales book, but it's, it's, I think it's more about communication and negotiation. So that's a go-to uh, book for me right now. I keep, le- keep reading it um, when, when I 
enter like new negotiations. Another one, when, if you want to learn more about uh, the venture capital world, it's uh, Venture Deals from Brad Feld. I know that you're a huge fan. I'm a, I'm, I had the lucky, I was lucky enough to meet Brad Feld in person many, many times working for Techstars. So I know he truly cares about founders. So for me, it's one of the most important uh, books that you should read even no matter if you want to be more involved in the VC world or if you want to raise money from the VC. And another one, I talk a lot with people caring about communities. So another book that Brad uh, wrote was uh, Startup Communities as well. So if you truly care about communities, that's a go-to uh, book. Uh, podcast, of course, the Crossing Borders podcast. <laughs> Can't miss it. And um, blogs, I really like uh, Alex Iskold uh, blog. He's the Techstars um, managing director for the New York program. He he blogs a lot about different topics on the entrepreneurial journey. So basically, if you want to learn about product, if you want to learn about even cold emailing, how to write we were talking about this the last couple of days, uh, how to write uh, investor updates. Like there's a huge amount of resources in, in his blog. Actually, I think he's writing a book about it with the, his best blog post. So Alex is called, I think it's a go-to place for, for entrepreneurs. So if you could go back to your start of your entrepreneurial career, knowing what you know today, what advice would you give yourself? Yeah, definitely. I think the most important one will be be a more uh, proactive listener. Basically, learn how to listen and also surround yourself with mentors and do not think that I know everything because you understand that you don't stop learning from other people's experience. So be humble. Uh, there's nothing better than to have a great mentor to learn, to learn or to talk to. You can have multiple mentors for your personal life. Uh, business advices, and so on. So basically, yeah, those two would be super useful. And what are you most excited about working on uh, to help entrepreneurs in Latin America with Magma over the next, say, six to 12 months? Man, um, I still I have, I still feel like I have um, unfinished business with Latin America. My goal, once I joined, I joined Techstars was to truly help um, entrepreneurs. I feel like I wasn't as successful as I was planning uh, to, but right now I'm very, that that's my life right now. I really want to help entrepreneurs succeed. I think um, with our experience, we can help entrepreneurs build their businesses in, 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 in Latin America. We can help them to build their businesses in, in, in the US. Uh, we have a very strong network. Given that I'm part of the Texas network. Magma is already part of that, that Texas network. And uh, basically, you will get access to uh, all that network if um, you become part of our family. So I'm, I'm very excited of what's going to happen with, with Magma, with me, in the not only six, 12 months, but also in the upcoming years. So um, yeah, can't stop to see what's going on and what will happen in the next few years, man. Well, I'm excited to keep working on it together. And thanks again for taking the time to do the podcast today. No, thank you. And um, yeah, let's make it happen. Thanks again for listening to this episode of Crossing Borders with my guest, Pedro Pablo del Campo. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please share it with a friend or give us a rating on iTunes and Stitcher. It's a really helpful way to get the word out about Latin America. Thanks to Angel and Sofia for helping to roost this podcast. And thanks again for listening and hope you have a great day.